Welcome to Educators Podcast. Hi, my name is Swapnil. I work as an intensive care specialist in Sydney. And today we have a very special guest from Chicago. His name is Dr. Eric Gantreka. Eric is a pediatric otolaryngologist and assistant professor of otolaryngology at Loyola University Medical Center, as well as the vice president, medical director of Level EX. He holds a Master of Medical Science in Medical Education degree with a focus on educational technology from Harvard Medical School and a Master of Science in Physiology and Biophysics from Georgetown University. He is a previous clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School and assistant professor at UT Southwestern. As a medical director of Level EX, he provides clinical oversight for all its video games developed for physicians and works closely with partners from medical societies and industry to develop innovative programs using the company's mobile, AR and VR experiences. His academic interests include implementation of educational technologies, motivational theory and the cognitive psychology of learning. He speaks nationally and internationally about educational technology, teaching made in 21st century and putting cognitive theory into practice for medical education. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, and today we are going to discuss about a very interesting topic that is technology in medical education. So let me start by asking you a fundamental question. Why do we need to use technology in medical education? <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, I... I feel like for a long time in medical education, there's been a very antiquated uh, way of learning. And, uh, you know, the traditional medical education model stems from all the way back in Flexner times from, you know, 1910 and the shortfall afterwards. Um, and technology has been very slow to be adopted in medicine, I feel like, more than any other arena, including K-12 and secondary education, which have done a lot of advancements in the last, you know, five, even five to 10 years. Um, you know, medicine really needs technology for several reasons. The, the doubling time of, of medical content is about 73 days um, uh, over the next couple of years. So that means the entire corpus of medical education knowledge and medical knowledge will double every 73 days. That's just a content need that is way beyond what our educators are able to do in, you know, a four to 10 year span that they have, uh, they have their learners. And on top of it, uh, you know, the whole millennial learner idea, whether you believe in it or not, um, millennial le learners and learners that grew up in a multimedia environment just um, handle information uh, very differently. Um, they really uh, consume lots of multimedia, so they're used to learning high volumes of information through multimedia. And so you want them to focus on that multimedia. Some say that the attention span of millennials is around seven seconds and less than that of a goldfish, whether you believe that testing or not. But, you know, in 2018, uh, millennial learners are, you know, all of us, uh, are exposed to in 60 seconds online, you there's about 4.3 million YouTube views, almost 18 million text messages, 480,000 tweets, 187 million emails, and over 2 million snaps and Snapchat. So just the sheer volume of multimedia that you're competing with for your learners is just immense, and that's just in 60 seconds. Combine that with the capabilities of technology, Moore's Law predicts that you know, the, du the doubling time of te technological uh, capabilities is about every 18 months. So technology is constantly advancing. And so, you know, you have these rapidly expanding content needs and you have this rapidly expanding technology capabilities. Why not leverage them for each other and be able to use technology in a, in a way that can facilitate learning and compete with these other multimedia channels to create genuine learning and be able to create uh, lifelong learners amongst our uh, students that are coming up in this environment. Wow, those figures are just fascinating. So what are the different tools or technology that can be used in modern medical education to tackle this problem? I, I get this question a lot, sort of being involved in this technology space, but you know, the overall challenge that we have to face is to engage our audience and spark curiosity. I think those two things are what we really need to be able to do to create these lifelong learners and to be able to keep their attention um, in the classroom or on the ward. And there's really simple things that can go a really long way. You know, um, you know, one thing is sort of the idea that 
we used to be content deliverers that for, for many years, if students just came to the classroom and listened to the lecturer and read the books, that they would walk out knowing what they need to know. But that's no longer the need. The, the content is all available online. Anybody can access it if they want to learn it. Um, just like you can learn how to change a spark plug in your car just by Googling it. It's the same idea, but the problem is, is it's the integration and critical application of knowledge that students don't have. And it's that it's the questions that you can't Google. That's what needs to be taught. And so there's really, really simple things. You know, some people have looked to just uh, computer-based uh, delivery of content um, in sort of a flipped classroom model, which flipped classroom is actually a relatively old concept, but it's been rejuvenated with the idea of online learning. Um, but, you know, flipped classroom can be done poorly as well, but essentially trying to deliver content through an online portal prior to the class and then focusing the classroom on delivering problems and cases where they have to apply the knowledge in a critical way and to transfer to different contexts. That can be facilitated easily with e-learning uh, e modules that are done really well. Something that I've used pretty heavily is audience response systems. A lot of schools have started to integrate these, um, but a lot of times they're just simple multiple choice questions or they're true-false. Uh, I sort of use them as open-ended, so there's several software um, that allows you to use your phone or your laptop or your tablet just to answer open-ended questions, and they could be anonymous. So I use them to sort of spark conversation, and um, most of my teaching is actually just facilitated through asking questions and having these open-ended responses and using those as jumping off points for discussion because your audience is much smarter than you think, and using them to, cr to create and co-facilitate the discussion is much better than lecturing to them. And so there's very simple things. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of people using PowerPoint improperly. In some places, they've even talked about banning PowerPoint. The problem is that people are using PowerPoint incorrectly. Um, you know, they're using it as a, you know, uh, writing the whole lesson plan on, t on, the, on the slides instead of using it as a, uh, again, a sparking off point for discussion. Um, and so there's a lot of things that, uh, that people can use to maximize uh, their abilities to transfer knowledge using PowerPoint. There's a bunch of different collaborative learning tools that we could talk about with learning management systems, things like simple as Google Docs. You know, mobile devices. Mobile devices, again, I use them uh, for good instead of evil by having people use them for audience response things. You know, a lot of people have talked about technology from simulations and task trainers and things like that. Um, you know, simulation, I think, is very good. I think it's had a very large role and probably one of the bigger technological advancements that we've had in medical education. But again, it has to be integrated into curriculum and there is some access issues and there is some funding issues that come with things like that. So I like to look to more, you know, free and accessible types of, of technologies. There are some online simulators, things that sort of create a physiological model that you can manipulate. I think those are super cool and super interesting because, you know, having the ability to manipulate things in real time and see what the physiological changes are is actually a very powerful thing for students and learners to go through. You know, I've had some classes that use Twitter, um, used a live Twitter feed um, to be able to uh, exchange resources and to be able to connect people to uh, each other um, and continue discussions and answer questions that maybe the teacher doesn't have time to answer. Again, that uh, can go both ways. You know, the a lot of things that I've worked with now, we, we do stuff with extended reality, things like mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. You know, we may talk about it later, but, uh, you know, a lot of the, there's been a lot of hype around these technologies. And I think some people use them improperly for things that aren't a value add to the learning. And, you know, there's a lot of media hype that you have to sort of sort through. Um, but there are things that actually are very good with those technologies that I think will maybe change the way that we teach medical education and, you know, different aspects. The last couple things, you know, games. Um, I've seen a lot of games being developed. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, even board games as well as computer games that have taught, you know, essential things. Like there's one that teaches you about running an ER and trying to create staffing. You know, I've seen a lot of really cool, fun games that are coming out that really help uh, hit home some really critical things. There's a sepsis game, I think, um, that's really that's really cool and interesting. And the last thing is is augmented or um, sorry, artificial intelligence. So you know, uh, students now are going to be growing up in an environment where artificial intelligence is going to be used most likely as a decision helper. And so trying to teach them how to use um, artificial intelligence to help making clinical decisions in real time, I think is something that you'll see in medical education coming up in the next 
10 years or so. Thanks, Eric. I think uh, one of the key message there was basically educators should be a co-creator and co-facilitator of the knowledge. Absolutely. Now, I came from a very traditional uh, medical school system and often the notion in medical education that it's more about the bedside teaching or the classroom teaching and you mentioned about that. As an educator, my job is to kind of just to cover the syllabus and make sure that learners understand the subject, they get the content and so that they can pass the exams. Do you think that technology is making life difficult for educators? Um, that's a good question. I think it's, I think technology is making people ask more questions, which I think is a good thing. You know, the old traditional way oftentimes still works with certain learners. So the other thing that we're, we at some point need to talk about in medical education is personalized learning that, you know, some students, if you stick them in a room for four years with the books and lectures, they will learn on their own. Um, recorded lectures, that is. They, they don't need anybody. Those are highly self-regulated learners who will graduate and know everything despite our best efforts. Those aren't the students that we need to sort of usher through. The, the students who have not as high self-regulated learning mechanisms, the students that need a little bit of extra learning, those are the people that, that we need to try and use technology to help them. And I think, I think the way of thinking of uh, we, they should just buck up and take it, we did it, we did it this way, I think is wrong. I mean, I think the education system's job is to give students that fundamental conceptual understanding and that groundwork and give them the skills to integrate new knowledge into those concepts and then be able to be become highly self-regulated learners and be able to become lifelong learners so that they can integrate this new knowledge. You know, with this doubling time of every 73 days, they need to be able to seek out new knowledge, figure out how to quickly appraise and how to integrate it into their, into their current knowledge base. And so each instructor needs to play their part in that. And so, you know, to be honest, you know, we, we, there's still too many people trying to deliver content instead of concept and application. And I think we need to be better about engaging our audience. I think we need to be better about sparking curiosity. And I think the traditional way of teaching did that for a while, but I think it's a, just a mass of knowledge and just the learners that we have. It's, it's not enough. We need to look to other things that we can use to leverage to be able to create more genuine interesting, engaging, curious learning experiences. And some of these technologies are very easy to adapt and bring in. I mean, I think the audience response system with open-ended questions has changed my teaching immensely. That is one small technology that has changed the whole paradigm of how I give learning sessions. And so I think uh, these traditional teachers Often, these are the same people who thought putting their slide decks on PowerPoint was a use of technology, even though it was the same information. That is not using technology as a value add. Yes, it makes it a little bit easier to edit, but it's the same information. We need to change the paradigm and be able to leverage technology, be able to teach technology like artificial intelligence, be able to teach our students how to navigate using technology so that they can handle all the content that they're going to see, not just the content that exists today. Um, and it's, it's simple sometimes to teaching them how to find reliable sources, how to access, you know, different uh, online tools, you know, how to honestly teaching the teacher, right? So these students are going to go on to be teachers themselves. And some of the best learning that can be had is when you have to teach somebody else what you've already known. And so giving them the tools to teach the next generation will solidify their own learning. So, and they're going to learn by modeling. So if you model good techniques of, of teaching and learning, they're going to take it to the next generation and use that. So you maximize that ability to create these lifelong learners, to create this technology as a culture base within the medical education system. And I think we're starting to see that a little bit, but it's not being ad adapted as, as fast as, as at least some would like to see. Now, clearly there's a generation gap between an educator and a learner. And as you mentioned, that even the technology is expanding quite rapidly. How much do the healthcare professional educators should bother about learning or using technology in modern curriculum? I think they should. Um, I honestly think that the old system of delivering the same PowerPoint that you gave 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, or even last week, is not the best way of doing it. Every time I go into a learning session, I change my presentation constantly because it's different learners, there are different learning levels, different goals, information has changed. I, I never give the same, uh, never lead the same discussion twice. And like I said, you know, for a while, 
you know, for some students, they don't need the teacher, right? If they just have the knowledge is out there, they can just look at Google. And I'll tell you, I promise you that every single learner in medical education Googles things. So if you think that they're not, they're, they are. They get a lot of information from Wikipedia. They get a lot of information from some of these other websites. Um, and so why not engage that? Why not allow that and be able, and they're going to use those tools for the rest of their life. So uh, not allowing them to access the information that they naturally would, I think, is shortchanging the learners. And I think that with very simple tools, you can actually make the classroom much more engaging, much more interesting. And just learning a little bit about what technology is out there, what, what your students are already using, so that you can say, hey, you know what, this is a good idea. Let's integrate this into our curriculum. Um, and I think curriculum should leverage those technologies. I think one one model that we've seen is how simulation is getting integrated into medical school curriculum. Um, that's, you know, there's so many um, rapidly expanding numbers of simulation centers in the U.S. And, and abroad that I think it's being much more quickly integrated into the curriculum because people see how using this technology as an advantage. And when I say technology, it doesn't mean it has to have a motherboard. You know, there's simple task trainers that I would say I would argue are technology that really provide good experience for learners that doesn't require a lot of knowledge about computers and knowledge about software and knowledge about hardware. Um, very, very simple things. I mean, the, the thing that's in your pocket is a computer. You know, our phone is runs faster. Um, I forgot the I forgot the the metric difference, but it's a huge difference between what got Apollo 13 on the moon, right? So what is in your pocket is hugely powerful, and why not use that for good instead of evil, so that they're not checking their Facebook and their Snapchat, you know, they're actually using it for something in the in the learning environment. I think that's a very important message. Now, you're already doing some work in this space. Uh, can you please share your experience with us? So I, I was involved um, for simulation for many years. I, before I went to medical school, I worked in an ER trauma center. I worked on an ambulance. I was an EMT. So I had a lot of experience in simulation. And so I've continued to sort of do that over many years. And once I sort of finished my training, I, you know, I've been interested in education the whole time. But really, technology really came to being once I started my master's program um, after my um, uh, fellowship year. And so I started really looking at educational technology. And, and I'll tell you that I looked at it from a K-12 and secondary education uh, standpoint, not just from a medical education standpoint. I did start doing some consulting through uh, through my company uh, for several companies. One was uh, do, using multimedia to teach surgical techniques. And so I worked with that company for a while and still work for that company. And I currently work for a, a video game studio that makes mobile video games for uh, medical education um, and for med and uh, continuing medical education for um, physicians in practice. You know, again, trying to play on that lifelong learning idea that there's better ways to provide lifelong learning and, and to support lifelong learning using technology, using games. You know, our, our video game studio does mobile video games, but we also do stuff in virtual reality, augmented reality. Obviously, I've been involved for games for learning for, for a while now. You know, I, I think the biggest thing in my experience in working in technology in this space is I still see a lot of people using tech for tech's sake, that they really play off on the media hype. But really what we, what I think is best and what we do here is we never use a technology like augmented reality, virtual reality, unless we see it as a value add to the learning. There's no reason to just do it just to do it, especially oftentimes it detracts from the learning experience because it's such a high cognitive load of, of dealing with a new platform, dealing with a new way of looking. Um, and so sometimes it actually detracts from the learning, even though it provides this media hype. And so I really implore people who are getting involved in this space to really critically appraise technology and don't use technology for technology's sake, only use it if it provides a value to the learning experience. And also technology doesn't stand alone as the learning. There has to be foundational learning principles and objectives behind everything that you do. And then technology brings that to life. It isn't the learning in and of itself. Yeah, I, I like the idea that you are basically bridging the gap between the technology and educator because previously technology was a domain of IT people and education was a domain of the educators. And I think now applying the cognitive psychology theory or applying the motivation theory, and I think that's just fascinating to see that how you are bridging the gap between these two things. Amazing work. As you mentioned, the technology can be two-edged sword. What are the precautions that healthcare professional educators should take in using technology? I think that's a great question. I think the first thing is open your eyes. I think educators who just sort of 
Uh, don't pay attention to what's available, what's out there, what people are using. Um, I promise you that if you go and ask your learners what technology they're using, um, you will get answers that you've never even known existed. So my first thing is, is just learn about it. Try to ask questions, talk to people, follow people, ask your students, follow tech forward people who are trying to talk about bio devices and augmented reality and artificial intelligence. And always watch technology with a critical eye. Don't believe the hype. Don't fall for the hype. Try to see what people are using the technology for and whether that that learning experience and that curriculum could exist without that technology. And so, you know, we talk a lot about immersive education. And so I think that virtual reality and augmented reality and any kind of mixed reality does uh, really um, have the hype that it, it engages by immersion. Um, but make sure that that curriculum actually needs immersion. Uh, if it doesn't need it, then there's no reason that they need that or the interactivity. You know, one of the best things about augmented reality and virtual reality is the interactivity. If it's just a visualization software, that can happen on a laptop. That can happen on an iPad. It doesn't have to happen in virtual reality unless, again, it adds something and, 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 and needs something. So I, I, I implore people to learn more about it, but be, criti be critical at the same time. And I think if people are wanting to start to use technology, choose one thing to really learn about and try to integrate into your own education. And like I said, my audience response system was the first thing that I just said, you know what, this is a value add. This is a really interesting technology that I think can really change the discussion, really change the way that I teach. And so I fully integrated that into my learning experiences. And so every one of my learning experiences uses that technology um, as a jumping off point to lead discussions and co-facilitate the learning instead of me being just sitting up there with a PowerPoint droning on and on. So I, I implore people to try and think about innovative ways and new ways to use technology in those learning experiences in large groups and small groups in all kinds of different ways. I think, again, that's a very important message that choose one and master one. Now, can you please recommend some of the key literature that every health professional educator should read in this space? <laughs> that's a great question. I, I think the first thing, I, and I've given some workshops on this, is um, there's something called Myers Principles of Multimedia Learning. Um, I strongly recommend that everybody who uses PowerPoint read it. Um, because there are ways using just the regular technology of PowerPoint and Google Slides and the like um, that you can, and Keynote that some people use, that you can change the learning experience just by making minor modifications in your slides. And, be, and again, remember that the slides are for you as the teacher to know what to talk about, not for the learner to read, because you can't read and listen at the same time. It's the dual channel principle. And so... Uh, the dual channel encoding principle, which is another good read that uh, I'll, I recommend, but the Myers Principles, I think, is a first really, really good read. If you have any interest in games for learning, one of the books that I read that I love, love, love is one by James Paul G. Um, last name is G-E-E. -E. Um, everything that he writes, I have really loved, and sort of the way that he thinks about games, the way that he thinks about um, different domains of learning is just really interesting. And it, it spans across not just medicine, not just games, it spans across everything and the way you learn, the way you think about things. I think I really, really love his work. You know, I think anything that's, uh, there's tons of articles and stuff around augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. I think the last I would like for people to read about is uh, the idea of self-determination theory and self-regulated learning. I think those have really changed the way that I teach and the way that I give feedback and the way that I try to push students and learners um, because it really understands motivation. It really understands the cycle that people go through when they're trying to integrate new knowledge. Um, you know, Kolb cycle uh, is another thing that people always talk about. So if you want to read about sort of um, how people go through learning experiences, I think the Kolb cycle is really interesting and really uh, on point if you haven't already read it. Um, there's tons and tons of articles. Anything by, by the American uh, Medical Association or the American Medical AMEE, -E, they put out fantastic stuff. Their AMEE -E guides are great. Um, I think anything that they put out is a, is a highly recommended read. Thanks, Eric. And what's your advice to a budding educator? Um, you know, so it, similar. I mean, there, you know, there's there's a lot of people that are coming out now that are seeking out extra learning in education, how to educate. 
for a long time, we were all just sort of modeling our teachers and taking things here and there that we thought were really good and avoiding the teachers that were really bad and sort of made ourselves educators. But now there's actually people trying to go through faculty development sessions and intensives and graduate programs to try to learn how to be a better teacher. And I think that um, creating a community is the number one thing that you can do. So, uh, you know, I think reach out to those folks. Um, go to go to different sessions and different meetings where those people are. I already talked about AMEE. I think that's a fantastic conference. All the other other conferences like um, the uh, Medical Students Association, all of the uh, Graduate Medical Education Associations, you know, Harvard Macy, I, I, I'm a scholar alum from, and I really love their intensives. I think going to something like that to try and really focus your educational efforts, meet other people that are in that space so that you can start creating this network, creating this um, friendships that I've made fantastic friendships through that. I know Monash University um, has been has been uh, associated a long time with Harvard Macy. They do great, great programs as well. Follow some people on Twitter. There's a lot of um, people that are talking about technology and uh, you know there are, they have very active uh, social media profiles that you can follow them. I think reading, I think you can I think read a ton, try to get Try to get really dive into stuff that really interests you. And, and I really implore people not to just focus on med ed. Um, we have to remember that case-based learning actually started at the Harvard Law School, and it was popularized by the Harvard Business School, and then became adopted into med ed only recently to do case-based learning. And so uh, you have to look outside your own domain because there's a lot of things that can be borrowed and, and recreated and reminted from different disciplines that are really, really cool. I learned a ton from K-12, secondary education, law school, business school, the education school, all of these things that I've brought into my practice and my everyday teachings that you know, haven't normally existed within medical education. You know, and I think the faculty development sessions, a lot of institutions have so go to those at your own institutions. There's faculty development sessions with different societies, with different specialties, different disciplines. You know, there's the intensives through Harvard, Macy, and Monash. There's also graduate programs if you're really interested in trying to get uh, further education and actually get a degree through it. There's a lot of uh, health professions education, master's in medical education programs, and the like. And really try to create this community and create this conversation and push this conversation forward that we really need to try and maximize our teaching and our learning um, for this next generation because the challenges that they're going to face are challenges that we never knew even existed. Um, and the amount of content and information that they're going to have to manage dwarfs anything that any generations had to deal with. And so we, with new problems, we need to create new solutions. And I think technology is one of the ways that we can face that challenge. Thanks, Rick. I think that's a really, really good advice. I think we, as a new educators, have to keep our eyes open and I think mindful of this content explosion, which is coming in our way. So if budding educator has got any question or they want to ask you any doubts, uh, what's your best contact details? Uh, yeah, so they can always um, uh, check out my Twitter handle. I also have some blogs. I'm at uh, D-R-E-R-I-C-G-A-N-T. That's Dr. Eric Gant. Um, they can also email me at E-R-I-C dot G-A-N-T-W-E-R-K-E-R at gmail.com. And, you know, reach out to me on other social media platforms, LinkedIn and Dr. Thanks, Eric. It was a pleasure talking to you and thanks for spending valuable time with us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks.